thou fount. You know, come thou king. You realize we're singing a prayer when we sing those words? We're singing to God Almighty. I just want us to recognize what a privilege it is in that moment that God hears our prayers that he welcomes us to come to him and pray. This whole series is, is Jesus teaching us to pray. And I want to invite you right now, will you stand with me as we read Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6? In fact, tonight, the, I think the words will be on the screen. I want to invite you to read Jesus' words along with me as we, as we learn to pray together. You, you want to read with me? Here's what Jesus says. He says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's awesome. Go ahead and stop and sit down. You know, I've been in churches that have like read this every week, week after week. And, uh, and, you know, it's amazing how it can kind of lose its, its interest. But when you recognize this is Jesus teaching us how to pray, when you remember that Jesus is giving us a, uh, really a pattern, not the exact words, but a pattern for how to pray, this is a remarkable prayer. And it's so beneficial. Now today we're going to zero in on that part about give us this day our daily bread. But to set things up for you, let me tell you about when I was a kid. Uh, right about the age of my oldest son. My oldest is 13 years old. And you guys know what it's like to have a 13-year-old teenage boy in the house, right? It's like you see food, you see food, All you want is that they want to eat, right? And so for me, what usually happened is, you know, we would have dinner together some nights as a family. And, uh, and we'd get our plate and, and I would get my food. And I would devour it about as quickly as possible. I'm still a fast eater, by the way. Anybody else a fast eater? Right? I, I've got to like work to slow down and chew and count and all that. But, but I would eat my food, and then I would almost always be the first one done. And then I would look over at my mom's plate. And these are the words, and you could ask her about this. You guys can guess what I said. Are you going to eat that? <laughs> Are you going to eat that? And it, it became like just this, this kind of routine between us. Every single meal, I would eat my food as quickly as possible, and then I'd look over at a plate and say, are you going to eat that? In fact, this last week, we were visiting my mom, and uh, it was her birthday, and we had a meal together, and I caught myself just looking at her plate as I'm eating, like, I'm going to get some of that, right? But I didn't. I, I, re I resisted. But the deal is, as a teenage boy, I, I knew mom would give me her food. I just knew it. I was, I was so confident that the moment I asked her that question that she would, she would relent. She would, she would give me whatever was left on her plate, right? I mean, garbage disposal, Mikey likes it, all those jokes, right? I, that was me as a teenager, right? Are you going to eat that? But, but I tell you that story because it sets up exactly what Jesus is teaching us in this passage tonight. Jesus uses these words as, as a pattern for us. He says, give us this day our daily bread. And in the same way that I was, I was able to be confident in asking my mom for just some extra food, here's what Jesus is teaching us with this line. He is teaching us to, to confidently, with confidence, ask for God's provision. Brothers and sisters, those who are believers in Christ, when Jesus teaches us this line, he, he is actually giving us a, a, the privilege of confidently asking for God's provision. Now, give us our daily bread. The question then is, wh what kind of provision can we ask for? When Jesus says to, to pray like this, and he says, give us this day our daily bread, is he, is he training us so that the only thing we expect from our good father is like prison rations, like once a day we get some dry bread and some water? Is that what he's trying to teach us? I mean, what exactly is it that we're meant to ask from God in terms of provision? Should we, should we let the pendulum swing all the way to the other side where we say, well, you know what, God, for, for my daily bread, for my provision, I could really use a Ferrari. <laughs> or should we be asking God for like a, like a just a, you know, a, a, a mansion of a house and, and extra, you know, the extra fine clothing? Are, are those the provisions we should be asking of God? What is Jesus getting at when he, when he trains us? 
No, no, no. Listen, when he disciples us, when he, as his apprentices, when he says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he lands right here today. Give us this day our daily bread. He wants us to confidently ask for God's provision. Well, let's turn back to our text. Give us this day our daily bread. Heavenly Father, please, please meet our needs. Please provide for us. See, the real question tonight is, what is it that God provides for us? What is it that we should ask God to provide? What is it we can expect God to provide? Now, there, there's tons of passages about God providing, and, and so I want to kind of anchor our thoughts in, in a handful of ways that God provides. And the first, and the most basic, is, is that God provides for our physical needs. God's a good father, and he provides for our physical needs. Now, now, here's the deal, though. What we think we need and what God says we need, those are often very different things. What we think we need and what God says we need, they can be di different. But Jesus himself, in this very chapter, he teaches us that God, in fact, will provide for our needs. If you're in Matthew 6, just scroll down a little bit to get all the way to verse 25. Let me, let me walk you through this a little bit. Jesus, in, in talking about not worrying and not being anxious for the things of this world, for clothing and, and for a place to live and for food, he, here's what he says, verse 25. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or, or what shall we drink, or, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, those without God, the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Here's the verse we looked at just a few weeks ago. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We handled that last verse a few weeks ago, but, but you realize I'm kind of like cheating by preaching Jesus' like most famous sermon here. I mean, Jesus just, he masterfully lays out illustration after illustration, painting a picture for you about how God promises to care for you. I mean, you pick up on these examples. He says, go, go look at the birds. They don't have a barn they don't store everything up for the winter, yet God takes care of every one of them. And he says this, aren't you much more valuable than them? The answer is yes, because you have the, the image of God. You're made in God's image. You're much more valuable. He says, he says, look at the field. Look at the grass and how the wildflowers or the lilies, how they are arrayed in glory. And then he talks about Solomon. You might not know who he is. Solomon was like the richest king of the Old Testament. He says, even when he was arrayed in all of his glory, he doesn't even compare. And then Jesus, speaking to you, says, don't be anxious can I paraphrase? Don't be anxious about what you need. He says your, your father knows exactly what it is you need. He already knows. See, see you, you, can, you can isolate two truths here very clearly. God knows your needs. In fact, he knows them better than you do. God knows your needs. He knows them better than you do. Verse 32, your heavenly father knows 
that you need them all. And not only that, God will provide what you need so you are free to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Because you know God will provide, because God has promised it, and because Jesus is training us to confidently ask for God's provision, because you can bank on that, that means you can change your, your focus. Instead of worrying about the, the things of life and being anxious and stressed out about them, Jesus says, no, 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 God will take care of all of those things, so turn your attention to his kingdom, living under the rule and reign of Jesus, And turn your attention to his righteousness, living like Christ in right relationship with God. In fact, I love how Paul, kind of talking about this exact same issue, Philippians 4.19, here's what he writes. He says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus You want a promise from God that you can cling to? I mean, I I did a wedding this afternoon. That's that's why I got the cool digs on, right? You want a promise from God? I just watched a young couple make promises to each other. This is God's promise to you. Here's what it says. And my God will supply some of your needs. No, no, no. My God will supply most of your needs. No. My God will supply most. Every need of yours, according to the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Here's what Paul reminds us of. God will meet every one of your needs. They will be met according to to his, his rich provision based on your identity in Christ Jesus. Now, this identity in Christ Jesus, this has us lean into the next thing that God provides. God not only, pro- not only provides all of your, your physical needs, but listen, God provides for your spiritual needs. God provides for your spiritual needs. Here's the deal. There are things in our life that are weightier than bread. I mean, it, okay, God provides for my, my, my physical needs, He's promised to care for what I need, even if, even if what I think I need is different than what he says I need. That's one thing, but, but there are things weightier than having a roof over your head, having clothes on your back, and having food on the table. What's weightier is, is your soul. You realize God provides not just for your physical needs, but, but the, the greatest truth ever is God provides for our spiritual needs. Let me give you an example of this. It's from the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22, it's very first book of the Bible. Here's the context. God made a promise to this guy named Abraham. The promise is Abraham, even though he was old and past the age, him and his wife past the age of, of rearing children, God made a promise that Abraham would have a son And Abraham waited, and Sarah waited, and finally the son showed up, and God delivered his promise. And not only did God make this promise that Abraham would have a son, but all of God's other promises were resting on the shoulders of this this boy, Isaac. God said, you will be the father of many nations. You will have descendants like the sand of the sea. All of these promises were resting on him. And then you get to Genesis chapter 22. I'm I'm just going to... I'm just going to read it for you. Here's what it says. It says, after these things, after God making these promises and delivering the son and giving him Isaac, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. What? So so Abraham, Abraham ran away. No, no, Abraham obeyed. Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, 
and two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they both, went, both of them together went. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And Isaac said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Listen to these next words. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for burnt offering, my son. God will provide. So they went, both of them together, verse 9, and they came to the place of which God had told them. Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and, look, and looked and behold Behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. This is an incredible passage. This is an incredible passage where the sovereign God who knows all things tests Abraham. Now, because God knows all things, I, I believe God knows exactly how Abraham's going to respond. I think it's Abraham that's unsure how he's going to respond in that moment until finally he says, I I'm trusting that God will provide. Isn't that what he says in verse 8? The Lord will provide the offering Abraham recognizes, in fact, the, the New Testament tells us that Abraham has faith in God, that God can resurrect the dead, which leads Abraham to obey the seemingly impossible commandment. But all of this, as powerful as it is, it is it's foreshadowing to, to an even greater moment where an even greater son was led up on an, an even more terrible hill just outside the city of Jerusalem, where God sent his son, his only son, whom he loved, to do what? To carry your sin and my sin to carry him outside the city limit and to be, to be nailed to the cross where your sin and the consequence of it was paid for. When Jesus died for us and was buried so that all of our sins could be buried with them. And then on the third day, by the power of God, Jesus was resurrected so that what? So that everyone who believes in him, listen, everyone, anyone, all of us, whether we have our life together or whether our life's in rags and on the edge, everyone who believes that truth has forgiveness. They're made clean. They're made new, they're made whole, they're made right with God. You see, we could pray, give us this day our daily bread, and we can just hope for stale bread and water. Or we can recognize that God does not just provide for our physical needs. He, he has provided for, for the most substantial need that exists in every one of our lives, a spiritual need which is to be made right with God. 
and recognize Jesus is teaching us here. He's teaching us in a physical context, but it's so much more than that. He's teaching us to go to God, confidently asking for God's provision. See, for you and I today, if we, if we believe that, Jesus' words, they, they mean so much to us. Because here's what we learn. We learn that we can trust God will provide because we know God has provided when, when we're in those moments of uncertainty, whether it's for physical provision or, or in those moments of uncertainty when there's spiritual un- uncertainty, right? Here's what we do. We remember all the ways God has provided in the past. Some of them tiny, so, almost so small that we don't even notice them. And some of them incredible and powerful and meaningful, but all of them stand in the shadow of the cross and how Jesus died for our sins because God provided in the past. We know he will provide in the future. Look at Romans chapter 8, actually. Listen to the same idea. Here's what Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says, along the same idea of God's provision. It says, He, God, who did not spare his own son, Jesus Christ, But gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Paul says, The Father gave you his son, his only son, the one that he loves. Do you think the Father is going to hold back anything else you need? He gave you the most valuable thing throughout all of creation and all eternity. Why do you think God will withhold anything else that you need? But again, the question is, what what is it we need? The context here, if you were to back up, you would see the context is is he's going to provide for you to be sanctified. We talked about that last week. He's going to provide for you to be glorified. That's the final moment when you stand in heaven with God and all your sin, all the struggle, it's all gone and you just get to reside in the glory of God forever. He is going to provide eternity for us. And and so we we can have confidence that's coming because of what God has already done. It's kind of like when I... When I know my wife is cooking a special dinner, and uh, you know she says, "Hey, would you would you pick something up on the way home? Right? Would you swing by the store and grab something?" And I don't know about you, I, I don't go into the grocery store as often as I used to. I used to work in a grocery store, so I'm very familiar with with everything in them, right? But uh, you know, she'll ask me, "Would you pick something up on the way home?" And and I'll go in there, and, and because I'm not in the grocery store a whole lot, you, you know what I see? I see all the bags of chips on the end aisle. I see all of the candy bars that I haven't seen in a while, and I start thinking, I could eat all that before I get home. <laughs> and, and I, you know, sometimes I, I, I fail, sometimes I succeed, but, but, but I have to practice self-control. But here's, here's really what's going on in my mind at that moment. I say, I know I have an incredible dinner waiting for me. Why would I settle for some Doritos? I mean, Doritos are good, don't get me wrong. But, but, but if I have a steak dinner waiting at home for me, I am not going to fill up with the, you know, with the Snickers or a Reese's, although Reese's are pieces, you know. Let's not talk about those right now, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Heaven is waiting for you. You are on the verge of eternity right now. There's, there are kids in this room, children in this room. You are on the verge of eternity. Even if you live 100 years on earth, it pales in comparison to the glories waiting and what God will one day give to us. We, we can trust it's coming. And so because we can trust that God has provided and will continue to provide, not just for our physical needs, but also for our spiritual needs, you know what happens? That changes the way we live here today. We we stop eyeing those Reese's Pieces. We start eyeing that steak dinner that's waiting for us. God, see, he, he, He will provide everything you need, but listen, 
he will do this from his divine vantage point. God will provide everything you need, but he's not doing it standing right down here on earth, looking at uh, the struggles and, and the day in, day out. He, he, he's going to provide everything you need from, from his heavenly vantage point. That This means that one of the greatest thing God, things God provides us with is contentment. In fact, I want you to say that word with me. Say the word contentment. Contentment. God provides for our, our physical needs. That's awesome. Even better, God provides for our spiritual needs, namely salvation. That is incredible. And part of that is God provides for our contentment. I quoted from Philippians 4 just a little bit ago. Philippians 4 is written by Paul when he's in prison. Look at chapter 4 again, this time starting in verse 11. Listen to what Paul says as he's writing from prison, talking about his contentment. He says, now that I am, excuse me, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger. Abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You realize what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying, from prison, I don't really have needs right now because I have learned that regardless of what I have or what I don't have, I have learned how to be content. I, I have learned the secret of having abundance when he's surrounded by friends and they're feasting and they're toasting and they're celebrating the kindness and the goodness of God. And he says, I have learned how to be to how to be brought low and have nothing. And those moments, maybe in his travels, maybe after a friend had abandoned him, or even in some moments when, when a co-worker had betrayed him, maybe in those moments when he hadn't eaten for days and he's still traveling and no one has responded to the gospel for who knows how long, and he feels like he's at the end of his rope, yet he is content. See, contentment comes from knowing God provides perfectly from his divine perspective. I'll just be honest, I struggle with that. Don't, don't, don't you? I mean, we, we live in a world with all sorts of flashy things all over the place. We live in a world where there's, there's more tech coming out all the time. I mean, more, more books coming out that need to be on my shelf. I mean, all these, uh, this world, is just all these things calling to us, right? I mean, my email box today, I, I got a notice, hey, trade in your car, 0% down for anyone else. It's like, I don't need to see this. I need to learn to be content. It reminds me of uh, sometimes what I see in my heart is kind of like the, the Veruca Salt perspective. You guys know who Veruca Salt is? She, she's the girl from, uh, from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. She, she, she's wealthy, and she's used to having every need, every desire, every want given to her at the drop of, her hat, of a hat. Her father is kind of like a, this guy that just bows to her every beck and call. And in the, in the movie, there's, there's this song where she starts singing, I want it all. I want an, uh, a goose that lays these eggs. I want it now. And she just sings this whole song until she ends up on the scale that judges the eggs. And then it says she's a bad egg. And it shoots her out into the... Uh, the inferno, actually, is, is kind of dark, right? But, but you ever feel that in your heart? I want it all. I want it now. I don't want to wait. I don't want to be patient. I don't want to be content. God, look at what my neighbor has. God, look at what my brother or sister have. God, I, I, my life would be so much better if only I had in the blank. What is it for you? If only I had this, God, my life would be 
complete. The problem is it is never enough. In those moments in my life where I've wanted something so badly that I had to have it and then I got it, guess what? My life wasn't complete. Before too long, there was something else I wanted. Something else I needed. This is, this is the opposite of contentment. And, and, and I imagine that you struggle with the same exact thing I do. In fact, a, a Puritan writer he, he named Jeremiah Burroughs, he wrote this book. I love the title. Just listen to the title. It, the, the title of the book is called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. I mean, just think about that title for a minute. He, he's saying it is a rarity. There's something rare about Christian contentment. This is kind of a commentary on my soul, maybe on yours. As, as he looks out and he sees everyone wanting it all and everybody wanting it now and believers acting the same exact way, longing for what's next, longing for more, he says it is rare that believers are content, yet we should be. We should all be. He says it's a rare Jewel. He doesn't say the rare burden of Christian contentment. He doesn't say the, the rare torment of Christian contentment. He calls it a jewel. I, I don't know if you have any jewels. We, we don't have a lot around our house. I think the, the, the most uh, brilliant jewel we have in our house, it's, it's on my wife's wedding ring. And I think about buying that, and, and it's valuable. It's got a monetary value, but it has a an emotional and a commitment significance that, that far outweighs the price that I paid. This is what contentment can be for you today. As you say, I trust that God will provide my every need. If you learn contentment, you find something that is valuable, that is, that is full of significance I haven't even quoted the book yet. I've just talked about its title. I mean, he says, the rare jewel of Christian contentment. Here's how he defines it. Listen. He says, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit. It's, it's inward. It's something inside of you. It's not, it's not you've had all the externals met. It's something inside of you which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. Now, this guy's wordy. You can tell he was a Puritan. Let me, let me translate this for you. It says, contentment is it's the inward blessing of voluntary submission, believing that whatever happens in your life, you know that God is good behind the scenes. Here's what he says contentment is. In modern day language, he says it's an inward blessing as you submit to, to whatever is happening in your life, knowing that behind the scenes, even if life is hard, even if things aren't working, even if you're struggling and it's an uphill battle, that behind the scenes, your good and heavenly Father is working and he is faithful. That is, that's contentment. That's contentment. Have you experienced that? When I, when I think about this prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and then I get to this moment. Give us this day our daily bread. Here's what I realize I'm praying. I, I am praying a prayer that, that trusts that God will provide. And I'm praying a prayer that, that is committed to be content with whatever it is that comes from his hand. You see how those work together? They work together perfectly. You are to confidently ask for God's provision. Ask him to meet your every need. But at the same time, as you pray, confidently asking for his provision, you say, God, I, I will accept whatever comes from your hand. When's the last time you did that? How about we take some time tonight and do that? 
I want to invite you to, to simply close your eyes right now. To go to your heavenly Father and in, in just in silence, ask him to provide everything you need. You know the specifics of your life. And as you ask, ask him to provide contentment. Ask him for that incredible gift, that rare jewel that you will be pleased with whatever comes from his hand. Take this next moment between you and him. Heavenly Father, in, in this room we can hear a, a child or two in their coos and, and hear them wheeling, roaming around a little bit, and, and Lord, we, we're reminded that just like that child has needs, we come to you as your children. We, we bring you our needs. But Lord, you know that the needs that each of us have in our lives better than we do. And God, we, we confess that there are times when we get our needs and our wants mixed up together and confused. And so sometimes we ask for things that we, we really want and don't need. And, and sometimes we don't ask for the things that we do need. But, but in this moment right now, we come to you. And God, I pray that you would provide. I pray you would provide our, 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 our daily needs. Lord, we know that you will. We, we know that you will care for us. But, but Father, it's not just the physical needs that we're asking for today. Father, I pray for those in this room, for those who, who are streaming online, I, I pray for each of us right now in this moment that, that you would turn our attention to the greatest need we have, the need to be reconciled and forgiven. Lord, Lord if there's anyone watching right now, anyone listening right now who is, who is yet to trust in the death and resurrection of Christ, maybe even those who have kind of gone through the motions, but, but yet to actually trust in the Savior, I pray in this moment you would lead them to, to a living relationship with you through, the, through your Son and our Savior Christ. God, for those who have experienced that, we rejoice. Our soul magnifies you, Lord. We rejoice in the God of our salvation, and we ask that you would give us this incredible gift, this rare jewel of contentment. Lord, help us to stop chasing after materialistic things. Help us to stop playing the, the game that sometimes we play about what we can own and, and the stuff that we have, and instead, let us learn the secret that Paul learned to be content when we have everything and when we have nothing because we know we have you because we know we have an eternity with you waiting. And God, we, we thank you that you are working in us right now. I thank you for your spirit that lives in us and, and is moving us toward holiness, that's, that's helping us to think more and more in line with the scripture. And God, as we as we are transformed by your spirit, I pray that you are glorified. All this we pray in the great name of Jesus Christ. Amen.